done with uh, your Christmas cards? Have you recycled them? Have you just bin them? Or do you, uh, some charities like them so they can cut the front off and stick them on another card and use them next year? I'm sure, I can't remember who it was, but once I got one which just had arrows between, you know, to Bob say, to Bob, happy Christmas from Ian, and he just sent arrows and swapped it round and sent it back the next year. That's uh, creative for you. What about the letters that come with them? You know the letters, those round robins that tell you what people are up to them. They can't be reused. You just recycle those, don't you? And so, if you're honest, sometimes you read them, you think you might as well recycle them before you've read them. Sometimes they're not very exciting, are they? They tell you all about little, little kid that's learning the bassoon or something or sometimes some people will write and say we only managed five foreign holidays this year or something like that you know you know the ones or the tedious thing is when they start writing about people that you have no idea who they are you know um joanne had her third child you think who's joanne i have no idea i know you but i don't know who joanne is it's they're odd aren't they or they talk about weddings they've been to you have no idea who the people are but they're from people that you know. But imagine I brought my letters, the ones I've received, and handed them over to you to read. Now you do, don't even know the person that's written the letter. There is zero interest for you whatsoever, let alone, let alone Joanne having the children and all the rest of it. And perhaps that's how you feel when you read this bit of the reading, that Michelle, she did so well reading it, well done, Michelle. It's full of names that we can't pronounce, some people we don't know, and it's just, we're just overhearing somebody else's sort of Christmas card letter 2,000 years on. How tedious is that? Most preachers, when they get to this bit of the book, they just, they, they just bin it, they recycle it. They just move on to another book. But we're not going to. We're going to dig into it. Because actually, when you dig into this, actually hidden, well, it's not even between the lines, hidden in the lines, is some absolute gold, pure gold, that will be such an encouragement and a challenge and an inspiration to us as we read it. So we'll start off by meeting, let's meet the people, the postmen from Paul, verses 7 to 9. How easy it is today, if you want to send a message, you can use the post if you want it, it should get there within a day or two, first class and whoever, who knows how long second class, but most people don't do that now, do we? We just send a text or an email. In an instant, anyone we have a number for, wherever they are in the world, gets our message. We can get a reply within seconds if they're there by the, the phone or whatever. We forget that that's only really happened this century or a couple of years in the previous century. And 2,000 years ago, if you wanted to send a letter, yeah, there were postmen, postwomen, but really, if you wanted to guarantee getting your letter there, you'd send it with someone. That's what Paul is doing with his trusted postman. So let's just meet two of them. I'll just name these two. Tychicus, in verses 7 and 8. Tychicus will tell you all the news about me. Tychicus is, will, know, will know the news because he's been with Paul, been with Paul for quite a long time. If you read the book of Acts, Tychicus is there in the book of Acts, and he's mentioned in some of Paul's other letters. But he will be new to the Colossians. This church in Colossae doesn't know Tychicus. They've maybe never even heard of him. So they're not welcoming a new, an old friend when he turns up through the door. They're welcoming a new one. And so Paul wants to just give them a reference, just to show the sort of person he is, that he comes with Paul's blessing. So he is a dear brother, a faithful minister, and a fellow servant in the Lord. He is a dear brother. A dear brother. Now, Christians are described as brothers and sisters in one church family. This guy is a dear brother. He meant a lot to Paul. So that would partly be, I guess, because if you, if you were in a Roman prison... They didn't give you food. They didn't slop food onto your metal tray. You were just chained up and left. And if someone loved you, they'd come and feed you, family or friends. But if no one loved you, you're on your own. And you just die in jail. Well, Paul has such friends, close friends, supporting him, visiting him and feeding him. And one of them is called a brother because they are family together. So close are they. He is a faithful minister, literally a faithful servant. Faithful, you could trust this man with your life. And Paul is trusting him with his gospel letter. He's a trustworthy man and a fellow servant or fellow literally slave in the Lord. It's a staggering word. To be called a slave is a staggering word. The slaves were the lowest in society. If you owned a slave, they were yours. They were your property like your toaster or your washing machine. If you had enough of them, you throw them away. If they badly behave, you, you, know, you kick the washing machine because it's not well. You kick your slave. They're just a domestic appliance. You could have them killed if you wanted. They were yours to own. 
And Paul is calling himself a slave. He's so, he's the opposite of being full of himself, isn't he? He's, as an apostle, as a Jesus commissioned speaker, he's being so humble here. Rather than pushing himself to the top of the pile, he's at the bottom, he's a slave. Him and Tychicus together, fellow slaves for Jesus. They're bought by Jesus. Jesus is their master, their owner. But not like uh, human owners that could abuse or beat or kill their slaves. Actually, Jesus is the opposite of that. Jesus, as the owner, has actually faced the beating, the abuse, and the death to buy his slaves. That's the price he paid to get his slaves. By, by paying the price that, we, that they deserved for their sins, he pays the price so they can be not condemned but forgiven. Bought by Jesus, so belonging to Jesus. A Jesus who loves them so much he dies for them. So Paul, in gratitude, says, I am a slave for Jesus. I love Jesus so much. He gets my allegiance. He gets my loyalty. He is, I am obedient to him. He has my heart and my life. And this Tychicus, you know me. Actually, no, they don't know him. Sorry, that you've heard of me. And you're now meeting Tychicus. He's my fellow slave, my brother. Can you imagine that? How Paul feels about this man. Someone he can trust, someone he can rely on, who's, someone who's a slave with him, who will feed him, and he sends him off. He sends him off. What a wrench. What a gut-wrenching thing to lose a brother like this. But he's sending him off, and he tells us why, why verse 8, I am sending him to you for the express purpose that you may know about our circumstances and that he may encourage your faith. He's sending him off. He's sending uh, Tychicus to the Colossians because... He loves the Colossians. They're brothers too. Even though he's never met them, they are brothers. You think? And he trusts Tychicus so much, he will send him with the, to the Colossians with a message. He's entrusting their, really, their salvation, their faith in Tychicus' hands. Look, here's a faithful minister. He's going to come and teach you the truth so you can hear the truth and be encouraged about Jesus and keep going in your faith. He's going to teach you more about Jesus. And encourage you with our news. Which you think, well, what's encouraging about Paul in prison in chairs, chains? Where's the, the encouragement from that? Well, the encouragement is Paul is still believing and still fighting and still wrestling and, and, and doing everything he can to make Jesus known. He has no regrets about being in prison. He has no regrets about telling people about Jesus. He's not regretting being an invisible believer. He's... His prayers have been answered in the past. He's been bold to tell people about Jesus. And Jesus is worth telling people about. So Paul is a slave, bought by Jesus, but now trapped. How encouraging and challenging that we too are slaves of Jesus. We too have been bought by Jesus. We too need to live that life, whatever we face. And we can see in Paul... Actually, just to remind the encouragement of whatever we face, of telling our story, of being open about how we became Christians or, or why we still believe, even when we're in chains or trapped or beaten or ill or whatever we face, even in our chains, we still stand firm. Because that, Paul sees the value of that, how encouraging that will be for the Colossians. Now, encouraging it is for other Christians to hear those messages and encouraging for non-Christians to hear. They can be so blessed as they start to think, wow, this person really believes and asks questions and can make one more step towards Christianity. Tychicus, alongside him, is Onesimus. He, Tychicus, verse 9, is coming with Onesimus. Ever heard of Onesimus? Well, we should have done those who've been here uh, for the, a few months. A few months ago, we looked at the book called Philemon. Philemon was a, a leader in the Colossi church, and he had a slave. He had his own slave, Onesimus. Now, Onesimus, the slave, did a bunk. He ran away. He escaped. Perhaps he took money. Perhaps he stole from Philemon. And he went to Rome. And it seems he met Paul and became a Christian there. And Paul is writing a letter to, uh, to uh, Philemon. That's the letter we looked at a few months ago. And now this letter to the whole Colossian church. This slave has, has run away, but now he's got to come back. Because Paul's challenged the slave. He said, look... You've stolen from someone. You've broken a relationship. The trust is shattered. As a Christian now, you need to go home. You need to sort that relationship out. You've got to deal with this. We can't have this tear in the church. You've got to sort it out. So here he is. He, perhaps he turns up to the church meeting in fear because this man 
Philemon holds his, his hands in his life. He could have him killed, whipped, beaten, whatever. In fact, society would expect him to do that to a slave that's done a bunk. Well, Paul is sending a letter to Philemon to personally forgive him and welcome him as a brother. And now here's a message to the whole church. The church that would have heard about him doing a bunk. Perhaps Philemon came to church in a, a sort of grump one day. Oh, my slave's gone. I've had to get my own breakfast. And now here he has turned up again. Paul writes to the whole church, welcome him, this slave. He's your brother. Welcome him into your family. It's again, it's a reference. For Tychicus, you don't know him, but here's a reference. You can trust him. He's going to teach you about me, uh, Jesus, and give you news about me. Here's Onesimus. The last you heard about him, he was a slave and he was a thief and he'd done a bunk, but he is our faithful and dear brother who is one of you, one of you because he's one of the Colossian people, but one of you because he's one of your church, or one of you because he believes he's a Christian like you. He is forgiven. Just like you're all forgiven, just like you are sinners and you've messed up and God's forgiven you, he is now on equal status with you because he is a sinner forgiven by Jesus too. He's just as much a brother as Tychicus. Welcome Tychicus and welcome back Onesimus as family, as brothers. So Paul sends Tychicus and Onesimus. Don't worry though, they're, they're still with him. So Paul then talks about the partners still with Paul, verses 10 to 14. There is Aristarchus, verse 10. My fellow prisoner Aristarchus sends you his greetings. Now again, you can go through the book of Acts and you'll spot Aristarchus's name appear there. He traveled with Paul and now he's now in prison with him. Now, in prison, he could give up his faith. He could be furious. You, Paul, got me into this situation. I'm not talking to you anymore. That doesn't seem to be the case, does it? Aristarchus is sending greetings to a church. He still loves a church. He'd have to say hello to the church. So he and Paul must be still friends. He must still be a Christian because he's wanting to greet a church warmly. There's Aristarchus. And Mark, so verse 10, Aristarchus sending his greetings, as does Mark, the cousin of Barnabas. Now, here is one of the, the gems, the gold, in this bit of reading, in this bit of the reading, this is brilliant. If we miss this bit at the gospel, at the letter, we'd miss this absolutely fantastic little hint of what's gone on. Because again, Mark is known. Mark was known in the book of Acts. He travelled with Paul and with Barnabas. Barnabas is mentioned here, uh, his cousin. They went on a missionary journey together. They were partners together. They were missionaries together. Except Mark pulled out. He chickened out. He said, I don't want to do this anymore. And he went home. Now later, his cousin said, actually, Paul, can we have him back? He's, he, he wants to come back. And, and Paul was, at that time, no. I cannot trust that man. He must have really hurt Paul in some way. Paul said, I'm not having him. I won't trust him. And Paul and Barnabas, who'd worked so closely together, ended up in a huge fight, an argument. Barnabas saying, you've got to forgive him. And Paul says, I cannot trust him. And in the end, Paul and Barnabas split up. They go different ways. Barnabas says, I'm taking Mark with me. And he goes. And Paul says, I'm taking Silas with me. And he goes. And they go to separate places. It's a, this guy, Mark, causes this, this split in church life. A sort of nasty stain. It leaves a nasty taste in the mouth. But hey, it's the kind of thing that happens in churches. People fall out and people leave and people come. Now, that all happened, they, the experts ex estimate, about 12 years before this letter was written. But now look. Here's Mark with Paul. They've renewed their friendship. They've renewed their relationship. There's renewed confidence for Paul, from Paul for Mark. So Paul is sort of a living example to them of, of how to treat somebody. So he says, you've received instructions about Mark. So you've heard news about Mark. His, his abandonment of the faith or whatever would have been well known. But you've received instructions. You should, if he comes to you, welcome him. If Mark should turn up, you welcome him, him as a brother too, as I am doing. He's showing by example. Like they should treat Onesimus, I am treating Mark. Onesimus was not trustworthy, but is now a Christian brother. Mark was not trustworthy, but I welcome him back. He's a reformed character. Forget Mark's mistakes, he's saying. Think of him not as a defector, but as a defender of the faith. The Colossians were challenged to forgive Onesimus. And Paul lives an example by forgiving Mark. Even though someone makes a mistake, even though someone commits a sin, even a great sin, we must not hold it against them. We must forgive. 
That's what Paul has done after an initial falling out, after initial actually not forgiving him, after not trusting him, Paul has come to a point of reconciliation. And it's not half-hearted reconciliation. It's not a grudging thing. Paul elsewhere calls Mark his faithful fellow worker. And incredibly, Mark is chosen by God. This deserter is chosen by God to write one of the Gospels. Mark's Gospel is written by someone who gave up, but then comes back and is welcomed back. And if Paul hadn't welcomed him back, perhaps we'd never even had the Gospel that bears Mark's name. We mustn't keep accusing someone of a past sin. If we keep on harking back to a sin that should be forgiven... If we refuse to forgive, then we're in danger, Jesus says in Matthew's Gospel. If you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. Who have you written off? Who have you said, I hope I never see them again? Who have you neglected? Who have you said, I'm not going to reconcile with them? Who have you, who could you make a first step to, but you say, no, I won't? Who needs our forgiveness? Your forgiveness and a new beginning. There is a challenge there, but also the encouragement to those who have failed, to the marks here. Those who've let God down, let friends down, let the church down. There may be people here to do, today who served God faithfully but then gave up and have, and have given up and have stopped now, just feel embarrassed, so slow to get involved again. But God's the God of the second chance. He can use you. If only you'll take a risk, if you only you'll stand up, if you only step out in faith, God will use you. Like he used Mark. Okay, this Aristarchos, this Mark, and verse 11. Jesus, who is called Justus, also sends greetings. And we don't know anything about him, except he and Mark and uh, uh, Tychicus uh, and Onesimus. They're, they're the, the, the Jewish background. Uh, oh, I don't think Onesimus is, sorry. Tychicus, I'm getting confused, sorry. Aristarchus, Mark, and just, uh, Jesus, Justus. Sorry, they are the Jewish Christians. That's what my, uh, Paul is saying. Sorry, I'm getting my names all mixed up. They're the three Jewish Christians, the ones who came from a Jewish background. They're the ones that are remaining loyal. Only three. Of all the Jewish Christians Paul knew and worked with, they're the only three who stand by him now. That's depressing. Though Paul's not depressed because he's got others who are such a blessing. And these men, on them, by themselves, they have proved a comfort to me. They are they are blessing me, but others are too. So he names some of the Gentile background, the non-Jewish background Christians. Epaphras, verse 12, who is one of you? Epaphras, they'd be in the church going, yay, Epaphras, he's one of us. He's a Colossian chap. Look, there he is with Paul. And Paul says he is a servant of Christ Jesus. He sends his greeting. Another slave for Jesus says, hi. He wants to make sure you know he's saying Hi. Now, he's been mentioned before. Epaphras, it seems, is the guy who started the church in Colossae. So chapter 1 tells us, You learned the gospel from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf, and who also told us of your love in the Spirit. Now, we don't know why he's with Paul now, but we do know there he was starting the church and taking news from, of the church to Paul, and now Paul sending his greetings back. But more than his greetings, his encouragement, because look at Epaphras, what he does. He is, we're told uh, in verse 12, he is always wrestling in prayer for you, that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. Ah, oh, gosh. Oh, that that would be said of us, that we wrestle in prayer, that we so love people that we fight through the lethargy, through the boredom, through the business of life, through all the other priorities that we through the, the hardness of prayer, prayer is hard, but that we would fight and say, no, I am going to pray. I'm going to put aside my, my desires, my other times of, ways of using this time. I'm going to pray for my fellow Christians. Oh, that we would be like Epaphras. And pray what? To pray that these Christians would stand firm in all the will of God. That all of God's will that is revealed 
in the book of Colossians that Jesus would die and rise again and take them in our diagram from, from darkness and death into Jesus' kingdom, that they would stick with him until they get to Jesus' throne one day, that that will of God, that they would stand firm like a house on solid rock, would not be moved whatever the world chucks at them. He's praying that they would be mature, not like baby Christians wandering off to anything sparkly and bright that attracts them, but standing firm with Jesus, fully assured, he says, of, of Jesus' death and, and resurrection, assured, assured, certain of what they believe and where they stand and where they're going because of him. What great things to pray for his home church. And he's not just praying that for them. He prays it for churches up the road, just a few miles up the road. Are these places, Laodicea and Herapolis, that Paul says he is working hard for you? I think that means he's praying for them. He's wrestling for those churches too. Oh, to be like Epaphras. What a challenge he is, isn't he? To love people enough to wrestle in prayer for them. There's Epaphras and, verse 14, our dear friend Luke, the doctor, <coughs> and Demas send greetings. Luke also writes a gospel. That's Luke who writes Luke's gospel. And it's because of this verse here, we discover he's a doctor. Which, okay, so what? It's just a, an interesting thing, really. If you read the gospels, if you read a, an account in one of the gospels, Matthew or, or Mark is, and Luke are all very similar, they, Matthew and Mark will describe somebody who's ill or something that happens to get somebody healed. But when Luke describes it, often he adds extra details. He adds a diagnosis. He explains what was wrong with the person because he's a doctor. And it's just, it's just one of those beautiful things. The gospel and this verse here just tie up to build a character of somebody who, who knows his medicine and knows when a miracle is a miracle when Jesus really heals. He says hi to the Colossians, as does Demas. Now, it doesn't say anything about Demas. Apart from his son's greetings, but we know he's another dear brother. Someone that Paul loves and treasures and values, that shares in a ministry with, and is proclaiming Jesus as a committed Christian. Someone who is known by this church. If, if Demas is sending uh, greetings, then he is a Christian from many miles away who is known to them. So he's travelled in sharing his faith. And that's all we know about him. Except... In Paul's last letter, he writes this. In 2 Timothy 4, Do your best to come to me quickly, Timothy. For Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. What a sad picture. In this letter, Demas sends greetings, loving greetings to a fellow Christians in a fellow church, but a few years later... He's so attracted by the world rather than Jesus. He deserts, abandons, leaves Paul to rot in prison, essentially. Perhaps it's because Rome was a dangerous place. Perhaps he became scared. But he deserted Paul when he needed him most, when he needed his friends. He was afraid for his life, perhaps. Certainly Paul says he loved this world too much. And he turned away. And they're the two mentions we have of Demas. Faithful and then abandoning Jesus. Perhaps he turned back like Mark did. We don't know. Perhaps he just gave up. It's a stark warning, isn't it? That even the keenest of Christians can fall away. So watch yourself. He's a warning to us. Don't do a Demas. But here's Paul's team. The partners still with Paul. The postman he's sending with his letter to encourage the church in Colossae. Paul wrote, wrote many letters to many different churches. And scholars say, the, the academics, the wise people, the clever people of this world, say Paul was one of the biggest influences on Christianity and some people say Paul took Christianity and twisted it away from Jesus' message and made it his own, as though he abused and manipulated and changed Christianity for the wrong. As though he was working by himself as a sort of Machiavellian, uh, sort of twisting evil character, really, twisting like a puppet master, the puppet strings of Christianity. But that's wrong. He's not working by himself. 
He's working with a whole team of people, many others, some of whom he's been involved with, of them, them becoming Christians, but some of these people he hasn't been. So People from elsewhere, under different influences of Barnabas and Silas and all the other Christians around about. You can count on a, a, the fingers of a couple of hands the cities Paul went to, but there were many more churches besides. And he never went to Colossae. He's just writing to them because he's heard of them, but he never went there. The gospel message spread throughout the Mediterranean, and Paul was just one, a great hero of the faith. He wrote much of the New Testament, but he was just one of many spreading the message of Jesus. This, these letters, these words at the end, these names, remind us of that. Well, having sent his greetings, he now, uh, from other people, he now sent his own greetings. So, the post to be passed on. Give my greetings to the brothers at Laodicea, says verse 15, and to Nympha and the church in her house. Laodicea was just down the road. It's probably about four or five miles, maybe eight miles, I can't remember. It's not far down the road. And Hierapolis is just next door to Laodicea. We'll actually come back to Laodicea. We, unfortunately, don't have their letter because they're told to send a letter back, swap places and send your letters to each other. We don't have that letter. But we do have a letter to Laodicea in the book of Revelation and next week we're going to start looking at the book of Revelation so we'll go to Laodicea in a few weeks time but they're so close they had to swap each other's letters so verse 16 after this letter has been read to you see that it is also read in the church of of the Laodiceans and that you in turn read the letter from Laodicea which just gives us a hint actually of how we now have this letter in print in English in our Bibles because the church in Colossae so valued the letter they had that they kept it and preserved it. Perhaps they copied it out before they passed it on to the Laodiceans. Certainly, there's copies made because it's not just Laodicea and Hierapolis that get letters. Others get the letter. It's passed around all the churches and all the other churches' letters come around. And eventually, they're collected together as the New Testament we value today. They were such a blessing to these churches, so valued that they preserved them. They wouldn't bin them and recycle them. They were treasured. Even when Paul was still alive, Peter said that Paul's writings were called the scriptures, were called parts of the Bible, even when Paul was still alive. So highly did they value these writings. Now, if you just stop and think about some of the names he's mentioned here, I'd love to go to that prison cell. There's Paul who writes so many of the letters, and Luke, and Mark. Most of the New Testament is written with the people in that cell. What an amazing conversation you'd have if you were there. Then intriguingly, there's a message to Archippus, verse 17. See to it that you complete the work you've received in the Lord. Keep going, complete the work you've started, Archippus. What what does that mean? Well, we have no idea. Our only clue, I think, is that there's another mention in the New Testament in Philemon, that letter to the the slave owner. uh, Paul sends um, a message to Philemon and the church leaders Aphia and Archippus, husband and wife, it seems. So Archippus is one of the church leaders, the church that meets in your home. Okay, so Archippus hosts the church. They didn't have buildings like this. They just met in somebody's home. Perhaps the richer people would have a larger home for a church to meet in. And perhaps it's guesswork, but he's been told to complete his work. So perhaps he's tempted to give up his work. Perhaps he's tempted not to have the church there anymore. Perhaps there was danger from having a church, threat from the authorities. Or perhaps he was more than a, a host, more, more a, one of the church leaders. Whatever Paul is encouraging him, keep going. He must have heard that he's not going to. So Paul, having seen other people desert, is really saying, Archippus, don't do a Demas. Finally, the P.S., in Paul's own hand, verse 18. At last the letter is complete. Paul has been dictating it. He's been speaking and someone's been writing it down. The people, the experts say Paul had, had bad eyesight, so someone's got to write this down for him. But now he takes the pen for the last line. I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. Remember my chains. Grace be with you. I guess that's his seal. His signature is saying, look, Someone's typed it up and I'm signing it so you know it's my letter. It comes with my authority. You know this is gospel truth because I am an apostle. I'm commissioned by, by Jesus. Jesus sent me to teach like this. So what I'm writing here comes with all of Jesus' authority. This is what Jesus wants you as a church to hear. Signed, love from Paul. 
So it's Jesus that wants the letter to be preserved. It's Jesus that wants the letter to be passed on to the churches again and again and again. And it's Jesus that's preserved this letter until here we are, 2,000 years later, with the Bible, with Colossians written in our language, in our church, in our time and place. We have now heard, as we've read this letter, we have heard what Jesus preserved for us to hear, what he wanted us to hear. So as we finish this letter now, why don't you this afternoon sit down with it? It will take you, what, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 max to sit and read Jesus' letter? Paul's letter to the Colossians, which is Jesus' letter to us. Why not read it as we finish looking at it and just be reminded of its awesome message, not least the description of Jesus himself, the image of of the invisible God. God himself come to us, the creator of all things, the creator of a new people of God. A people of God who these people we've just mentioned and only known by name are known and loved and with God now. And us who one day will just be names if we remembered at all are people who will be with God and with him for eternity. They and we together we were people in darkness but he has Paul told us rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son he loves in whom we have redemption the forgiveness of sins through Jesus cross we are forgiven everything through his resurrection we're taken into his kingdom we're part of Jesus kingdom our lives are being transformed by Jesus bit by bit God's powerful gospel is changing us and promising us an eternity round his throne Praise God. Praise God for his work in Paul that got him to write this letter. Praise God for his work in the church in Colossae that meant they preserved this letter and passed it on even down to us. Praise God that we can read this letter and grow through it and grow to be like Jesus because of it. Praise 